This is Bible Academy. Today we continue in our special series, The Life of David in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 1. Now before we begin, let's make sure that we confess our known sins according to 1 John 1, 9. At the same time, we're allowing His Spirit to control us. Let's pray. Almost gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and all that you've provided so we can study your word. We ask now that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are coming to the end of the series, the end of uh, this book, Second Samuel. We're in chapter 23. There's one more chapter. And we look at the last words of David. Now, these words are likely written by David himself, so we can also date them to about the 10th century. He will speak in the third person about himself in verse 1. Then in verse 2, he'll switch to first person. So first thing, he's speaking about himself in a third person. Now, these are the last words of David the oracle of David, the son of Jesse, the oracle of the man who was raised on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. Last words here, are not in the sense of his last words on earth, but more like his last will and testament. Verses 1 through 7 summarize his final literary legacy to Israel talk about the word oracle for a moment. Oracles often used uh, as a word from the Lord in a prophetic setting. A word from the Lord in a prophetic setting. Occasionally it's used uh, in a wisdom setting and that's what we have here. So David is going to make some observations or statements, wise statements about himself, what the Lord has done for him. The Oracle of David, the son of Jesse. This is coming from David, son of Jesse. We know him fairly well by now. The Oracle of the man who was raised on high, that is being exalted as king. The three titles David mentions of himself here in this verse, the Lord gets credit for two. He raised him on high. He also anointed him, had him anointed. The sweet psalmist of Israel could have the idea also of sweet singer, as the net Bible has it, either one's fine or both together. He switches to first person in verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. By me or through me is the idea. So the Spirit of the Lord, the Lord is speaking through David. He uses his tongue here um, as the uh, symbolic sign of the word. The word is on my tongue. Verse 3 the God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me. He continues on. Let me just look at these first two lines first in verse 3 because he's still speaking in the first person. So what you see on the board here is David speaking in the first person. In verse 2, the Lord spoke through him. Here, the Lord spoke to him. David got the message the Lord wanted him to receive. This is how divine inspiration works. David knew that the word of the Lord was in his mouth, on his tongue, ready to be spoke. We have some good verses on that. Psalm 139.4, Proverbs 31.26. Now, after he says, I have the word of the Lord ready to speak, then we go to the Lord speaking. In the middle of verse 3, when one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God. Now, these two 
lines are important to understand leadership. These are two of the prime qualities of an ideal king. Notice the word justly. It's also the same word for righteous. He does the right thing. He also does the just thing, the fair thing. The second key quality, fear of God, the fear of the Lord. That is the beginning of wisdom in the Proverbs. It's often related to wisdom. So the prime qualities of an ideal king, he's going to be righteous in his rule, and he's going to fear the Lord. He's going to respect the Lord. He's going to be, the Lord is going to be in the right place in his life. Oh, that we had these kind of leaders today. Oh, that God was in his proper place in their hearts and minds rather than themselves or government or whatever they worship. A righteous rule is compared to the benefits of sunlight in verse 4. This is the Lord continuing to speak. This type of leader, the righteous, the one who fears the Lord, he is like the light of the of morning at sunrise on a cloudless morning, like the brightness after rain that brings grass from the earth. The second half here compares a righteous rule and the fear of God to the benefits of rain. Uh, like the brightness after or associated with rain. Here's the point. A ruler who rules righteously and in the fear of God brings the benefits that sunshine and rain bring to people. Let me say it another way. A ruler who rules righteously and the fear of God is like the benefits, brings the benefits that rain and sunshine bring. They flourish with health and prosperity. In verse 5, David switches to the first person. For does not my house stand so with God? For he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things, and secure. For will he not cause to grow all my salvation and my desire? Both of these questions expect a positive answer. They're put in a rhetorical question form to reinforce David's confidence. Here's what they mean in a declarative statement. But David speaking. My house, my dynasty, will continue to stand. Ultimately, through David's greater son, Jesus Christ. This comes in the everlasting Davidic covenant, which is arranged orderly in its every part. And it is secure. Now this is what verse 5 means. I'll, let me read this one more time. David is saying, my house, my dynasty will continue to stand ultimately forever through his greater son, Jesus Christ. That's the everlasting covenant. This comes in the everlasting Davidic covenant, which is arranged orderly in its every part. Nothing's missing. Everything's there, and it's all secure. Then this last couple of lines, For will he not cause to grow all my salvation and my desire? Now the rhetorical question, to make it more forceful, here's what it means. The Lord will cause to grow or increase or fulfill every deliverance, every aspect of salvation. Now we've seen Deliverance many times with David, particularly in war, in battle, in fleeing some way. Every deliverance would be not only that kind of deliverance, but all the way to eternity, salvation, salvation from sin. The deliverances David has experienced on earth will continue on to salvation in heaven. 
Then we have, and every desire. That is, God's best for David. It too will be fulfilled. Basically, this verse sums up the best of David's life. He is convinced that the Lord God will fulfill every part of the Davidic covenant given to him by Nathan, the prophet, with all its aspects and in order. This is David's hope. This is what he has to look forward to. Even though he may die, this will come back to him on earth. Verse 6, David switches to the third person. But worthless men are all like thorns that are thrown away, for they cannot be taken with the hand. Now this is interesting. After David has just described or summed up the greatness of his life, not boasting of himself, but what the Lord has done. He's already talked about the Lord exalting him. He's talked about the covenant. He's talked about the dynasty. He has so much to look forward to. But then there's mankind who has nothing. And it's really quite sad. In contrast, look at verse 6, but worthless men are all like thorns that are thrown away. They're not any good. They're worthless. You can't do anything with them. For they cannot be taken with a hand. So this gets very, uh, what we might say, real. Put some skin on it here. Contrary to those who want to do the Lord's will, like David, there's the worthless people. Good for nothing, men. Like thorns from a bush. What good are they? They prevent the hand from making use of them. In this analogy, you can't do anything with them. You can burn them, throw them away. But it's best not to touch them. I think this is an excellent, excellent way to look at life. You're going to be like David, doing the Lord's will, following him. One to live a obedient, humble, submissive life, honoring the Lord, or you're going to be worthless. You're going to be worthless. You say that's pretty hard. Folks, let's be honest. People who don't know Christ are going to go to hell and they're going to burn forever. Listen to verse 7 talking about the worthless, the one who touches them must use an iron instrument or the wooden shaft of a spear and they're completely consumed with fire. That's what you end up doing with them. You knock them down, you pull them out, you throw them into a fire. They're no good. They have no usefulness for God whatsoever. In fact, one has to use a special tool just to deal with them. The thorny branches. And I'll tell you something, I like roses. But man, working with roses, I almost always get stuck a few times. You say, well, I wear a long sleeve. No, <laughs> that's, that's part of my dumbness, I suppose. But it gets too hot, so I don't like, like to wear long sleeves. But gloves are certainly necessary. But now and then I get stuck in the arm one way or the other. Some, will, some limb will swing over and hit me or flash back to me or something. And, and uh, there I am, got a little bleed. Uh, bleeding on me and I bleed quite a bit nowadays when I that kind of stuff happens these tools remind us of weapons used against an enemy so it's also true that deal, dealing with these type of worthless thorny people sometimes requires an appropriate weapon strong words another way to deal with thorny bushes or enemies is just to burn them and let the fire consume them. But still, they're worth nothing from start to end. From the beginning to the end of David's last words, we have here, we have the useful David, exalted, anointed by the Lord, in contrast to the worthless, 
thorny person who is tossed and consumed with fire. What else can you do with them? And it's sad. It's sad. But what an appropriate ending for David's last words. This next section of our passage is titled David's Hall of Fame of Mighty Warriors. We begin by going to 1 Chronicles 11.10. It has some information in it that the Second Samuel passage does not have, and I want us to see it. These were the chiefs of David's mighty, mighty warriors. They, together with all Israel, gave his kingship strong support to extend it over the whole land as the Lord had promised. It's quite a bit in this verse. So this Chronicles passage took place at the anointing of David as king over Israel after his seven-year reign in Hebron, 1 Chronicles 11, 1 through 3, followed by the conquest of Jerusalem, 1 Chronicles 11, 4 through 9. So this is the organization of David's army early in his reign. And I want you to notice, these men, along with all Israel, supported David. They gave him strong support. Now, what did we just learn about David? He had the fear of God, and he also ruled righteously. You know, it didn't, didn't say anything about his ability to fight or ability to be a warrior, but that was renown. Also, it's the Lord who anointed him, the Lord who exalted him, and now he has the people behind him, as this verse tells us. And these warriors. Now we're going to talk about the warriors. Verse 8. These are the names of David's warriors. These names are difficult to pronounce. I'll do my best. Josheb, Basabathet, Beth. Bashebeth, a Taket Ma. Night, he was head of the officers. He wielded his spear against 800 whom he killed at one time. Now, a couple of words here I want us to look at because they're frequent and they're important. Let's talk about the word warriors. It's a common word we see in passages like this. The word is Gabor in the Hebrew. It has several meanings, courageous, a great fighter, or valiant. You'll see these translations as well. The other word I want us to look at is the word for officers. Now, you won't see officers very often, but you'll see words that are often interchangeable, and yet they shouldn't be interchangeable. Well, what I mean by that is there's three words that look very similar in the Hebrew, and you keep coming across them in this passage. All three of these words, here they are, officers, the word three and the word 30. And if you look at your margin notes in your Bibles, that is when you see a, a number after one of your uh, words, you look in the margin, it'll tell you an alternate translation. It's not the same word, but what happens is when you have this many words that look alike, the copyists get confused, just like any human does. And if they have like these three words and let's say three or four lines, their eyes will skip letters. And we're talking about the Hebrew here. And you'll come up with a different word entirely. Now, three and 30 are similar. But then we also have the word officer. So when you look at your translations, you're going to see some alternate translations in the margin notes. So that's what I want to alert you to. Now, I think the Net Bible does the best job on this compared to the other Bibles. So I'm going to stay with the Net, and uh, that way you can follow it as well as mine. Mine's almost identical to the Net when it comes to the numbers here and the uh, as well as the uh, word for officer. So this tells us about this man. I just want to call him Josh Shedd to keep it short, okay? He's the head of the officers. He's mentioned first. 
He excelled at wielding the spear. He took out 800 men at one time. Now let's talk about this. What's wielding the spear? Well, the closest thing I can think of is someone who has a bayonet on the end of a rifle. He knows how to parry, that is, knock people's uh, bayonet away from him, to thrust, to shoot it forward, to slash, to slash down. He can do an uppercut with the back of his, his rifle, uh, or he can do a side, uh, sort of like a, a, a boxer, doing a uh, cross punch, uh, even with the ground. So there's all sorts of ways you can use a spear. But this man excelled at it. He knew how to use that spear. Uh, you remember uh, Abner uh, killing the brothers, the brother of Joab. When he was being chased, remember, he was chasing Asahel, was chasing Abner, and Abner used the butt of his spear. He knew how to use a spear. So this is part of the skill of how to use a spear. I mean, I can imagine it be much better than a knife, right? Even maybe better than a sword. He knew what you were doing. So what he did, and how he did this, I don't know. I have my suspicions that he probably had uh, a, a narrow passage where men were coming at him and he was ready to take them down one at a time as they came in. That's a lot of men. You can just imagine the, the energy it would take to kill 800 men. And the time probably take a good several hours. And you got to wonder how he did this. It must have been quite a sight. Well, anyway, he's number one on the list here. After him, nine... Verse 9, after him was Eliezer, son of Dodo, the son of Ahohi, two strange names. He was one of the three warriors who were with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle, and the men of Israel withdrew. Now this battle is described in that they were fighting the Philistines. This one actually took place when Saul was king. And Eliezer was one of the three noted who stood and stayed with David when they fought the Philistines. In that battle, it was so overwhelming. Apparently, the army of the Philistines was so strong and weaponized in uh, high numbers that the rest of the army of Israel took off. They retreated. They withdrew. This would mark Eliezer as one of the most courageous men in the entire army of Israel there with David. Now think about what you would need to do that. Now we know that David fought Goliath. Tremendous courage. But he also trusted the Lord. He knew the victory was the Lord's. If you remember that scene, a great scene. You know, victory is the Lord's. So you're just going to go in there and be used by the Lord. And this is what they did. So Eliezer gets the number two spot here. He's one of the three. Verse 10 Here's what he did. He rose and struck down the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand seemed stuck to the sword. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day. Notice, the Lord brought about a great victory that day and the men returned after him only to strip the bodies. Now this notes two or three other things about this. Not only did they run, but they came back later to get the, the stuff, weapons, whatever they had on their bodies. Notice about his hand here. Though his hand was tired, it was froze or stuck to the sword like it was some sort of cramped, and he couldn't let go. Uh, it's one of those scenes where you see somebody come up and peel the, the weapon out of their hand. The Lord brought vict victory that day, nevertheless. It's noted that the troops fled, only to return later to strip the bodies of equipment and goods. You recall the Philistines doing this to Saul later on. 1 Samuel 3, 31, 8, after his death. Next is Shammah. And next to him, this is verse 11, and next to him was Shammah, the son of Ag, the Herite. The Philistines gathered together at Lehi, where there was a plot of 
ground full of lentils, and the men fled from the Philistines. The men flee again. This man is described as a Herite, probably uh, indicating some sort of Gentile origin. Later, he's said to be the father of one of the 30, we'll see mentioned down in verse 33. The battle is said to take place on a field of lentils, a plot of land there. And again, the men fled from the Philistines. Shammah decided to take a stand. Look at verse 12. But he took his stand in the midst of the plot and defended it and struck down the Philistines, and the Lord worked a great victory. You know, this took tremendous courage, just like the previous two we saw. The Lord was with him. He knew the Lord was with him. And like David fighting Goliath, he knew the victory was the Lord's. Great lessons here, folks. When you're right with the Lord, when you're doing the Lord's will, the Lord will give you the turnout he wants. The Lord worked through Shammah in scoring another victory. Here's another case where the army of Israel fled, probably because of the overwhelming numbers. And yet one man stood there, stood his ground, and the Lord granted victory. The next account is one of the best stories in this passage because it reveals the noble qualities of the soldiers and King David. Verse 13 the time of the harvest, three of the thirty leaders went down to David at the cave of Adullam. A band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Raphaim. Now we've studied this battle of Raphaim. I'm assuming this is one of those. Verse 14, David was then in the stronghold, that would be the cave of Adullam, and a garrison of the Philistines was then at Bethlehem. Well, this provides us the setting. David was in the cave, and the Philistines had an outpost in Bethlehem. Three of the thirty are with David. David speaks, they hear him. And David said longingly, the word means desires, he really wants something. Oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem that is by the gate. David mentions that, he's, mentions that he's desperately thirsty. And he remembers the well of water in Bethlehem, perhaps from, perhaps from childhood or more recently. But something about that well there in Bethlehem, he wished he had some of that water. Probably he remembers as a uh, a, a, maybe a boy, a, a young boy, or, or later on in life, how many times he's been refreshed with that well, and he wished he could have some of that water right then. Well, these three men heard him. Verse 16. Then the three elite warriors broke through the lines of the Philistines and drew out of the well of Bethlehem, that was by the gate, and carried and brought it to David. But he would not drink of it, he poured it out to the Lord. There's a lot here in this verse, next couple as well. But just for David, these three men went the 12-mile trip to Bethlehem. They broke through the Philistine lines and retrieved David some water from that very well. But when they returned, David would not drink the water. Instead, he poured it out on the ground. Now, what is most uh, interesting here, as well as I think the most important thing to see, is the nobility of these three men and David. Two sets of noble principles here, one for the three men and then for David. So these three elite warriors, without orders, but wanting to please their beloved King David, and selfishly risk their lives to provide a drink of water for their king. One may think that this does not seem worth the risk, but what you got to understand, and which I assume here is the case, that they so admired David. We just saw earlier the support they gave him. They so admired David as king and as military commander that they felt they owed it to him. He earned it. He deserved it. 
for all the times he risked his own life, the self-sacrifices he made over the years, and the daring and sometimes unpopular decisions he had to make to attain victory and save their lives. So they honor David with their own self-sacrifice. David, in turn, pours the drink out on the ground as a libation offering to the Lord. He would not take their sacrifice to himself, but pass it on as an offering to the Lord. Now listen to the words of David, because he speaks to the Lord. Verse 17, And said, Far be it for me, O Lord, that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of the men who went at the risk of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things the three elite warriors did. So this sums up nicely. Changing persons. David calls the water in the cup blood. It represents the blood of their lives. They were willing to pour out their blood, their lives for David's sake. These men risked their lives for David. David, in turn, dedicated it to the Lord. It's like he dedicated their lives to the Lord for what they did. This shows something of the greatness of David. He would rather honor the Lord by this great act act of risk and self-sacrifice than take it into himself. So in a sacramental act, he gives it over to the Lord. The courage, the loyalty, the self-sacrifice, the gratitude of David all show the noble qualities of these four men. It becomes a point of memorial, something to remember, an act of courage, an act of loyalty, a sacrifice. I'd even add love. Just as the New Testament saints recall the woman who poured the expensive perfume on the head of Jesus. You remember that? Matthew 26, 13. So the Old Testament saints recall these three men sacrificed for their beloved King David. And then David in his self-denial responds by making it an oblation offering to the Lord. Both acts would be remembered for generations. Well, the next person we look at, we're familiar with, Abishai. Good old Abishai. Impetuous as he was, he was quite a warrior. Now, Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was head of the three. And he wielded his spear against 300 men and killed them and won a name among the three. Now, this tells us about the three. I thought about capitalizing this. Some of your translations do, but understand this is a particular three. Abishai was good enough to be listed with them, but he wasn't one of the three. All right. He was head of the three. Notice he gained his renown at this point by willing a spear. Again, we've talked about that. And he killed them. Uh, 300 of them. He's called here the chief of the three or the leader of the three. He was so proficient in wielding his spear. Uh, in this battle, he took down killing 300 men and won a name among the three. Verse 19. Let's put in a question form for emphasis. Was he not held in greater honor than the three, he became their officer, even though he did not attain to the three. So he was he was their officer, but he wasn't one of the three. That's what this is saying. He was greater than the three and became their commander, their officer. Though famous for his feet, he was not numbered with the three. That's what this is telling us. Verse 20, we come to a man we're familiar with, if you remember him. 
And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was a valiant man of Kabzil. And he did and did great deeds. He struck down two aerials of Moab. He also went down and struck down a lion in a pit on a snowy day. As a valiant man, his great deeds included striking down two aerials. You say, what in the world is an aerial? Good question. We don't know for sure. Some translate it as warrior or something similar. There are a lot of words that could be there, uh, but arrow's got to be something different in my view. So what happens is here, some of your translations will put a uh, lion. Uh, now, this is interesting. The King James says lion-like, and this is probably from the Apocrypha. That's the best I could find it. But I don't know if that's right or not. I don't, like I said, we don't know for sure. But whatever the aerial was, it must have been very difficult to kill. And he killed two of them. All right. Then it goes on to say he killed a lion in a pit. Presumably trapped there. And then killed him on a snowy day, indicating that that would be challenging because of the footing and slippery and so on. Not easy to do. So he has two feats mentioned here, killed two aerials, a lion and a pit on a snowy day. Well, he's not done. Verse 21 gives another one of his great feats. Verse 21, and he struck down an Egyptian, an impressive man. The Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but Benaiah went down to him with a staff and snatched the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Now, an impressive man, the meaning behind that is he's impressive to look at. Some translations put handsome. So Benaiah began to fight him with a staff. Now, a staff, uh, just don't think of it as just a walking stick. It's more than that. These were also used for fighting sticks. So he started out with a fighting stick and ended up snatching the spear out of this Egyptian's hand and then killed him. Now, let's talk about this man because we've actually discussed him before. Let's go to 1 Chronicles 11.23, and this will probably ring a bell. Think of giant. 1 Chronicles 11.23, and he struck down an Egyptian who was five cubits, that's seven and a half feet tall. Although the Egyptian had a spear like a weaver's rod in his hand, Benaiah went against him with a club. That's the translation. That's not my translation. He snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. So he hit him with a club, hit him with a, uh, a stick of sorts, but ended up getting his spear and killing him with it. Verse 22 sums up Benaiah. These things did Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada. And to him a name was given beside the three elite warriors so he became well known as well known as the three. Verse 23, he was renowned among the 30, but he did not attain to the three. So he was one of the better known 30 listed. And David set him over his bodyguard. You may remember that we discussed that back in 2 Samuel 8.18. He was over that group of mercenary bodyguards. So this is a repeat on Benaiah. Verse 24, the next person is Asahel. Now he's a repeat too. You remember him. He was the brother of Joab. He was among the 30. Uh, another one mentioned here is Elhanan, the son of Dodo of Bethlehem. So let's talk about these men. Asahel was killed by Abner. Remember, he was chasing Abner. He was really fast on his feet. And he was about to catch Abner. And he was getting up close, and Abner plunged the butt of his spear backwards into Asahel and killed him. 2 Samuel 2.22. The 30 here is a list of warriors, and here's what we're going to say about them. Now, there's some debate over this as well. 
who are these 30? Well, we know that from the context, they're all warriors. There's no reason to think otherwise. It appears that they also were on a war council. They were probably officers uh, or of the rank where they would have a lot of important information to say or discuss what was necessary for a battle or just to run the military part of David's uh, kingdom. They may have set up regulations for the army, decided on promotions and appointments, and handling other military matters. That's been suggested by scholars, and I don't have a problem with that. So far, the outstanding warriors we have are Joshib, Bashev, uh, uh, remember the big long name we saw first, Joshib, Bashebeth, that was in verse 8, Eliezer in verse 9, Shaman in verse 11, Abishai in verse 18, Benaiah we just saw in verse 20, and then we have the list of 32 names below. So we have these men plus the 32 below coming out to a total of 37. So now we get more into the 30. The mighty men or warriors continue. And we can go through them fairly rapidly because there's not a whole lot about them here. Now, let me remind you first, though, of who Elihanan was, verse 24. If you remember, he's the one who killed Goliath's brother. So we've seen him before as well. Now we can move fairly rapidly here, looking at these names. My biggest problem is trying to pronounce them. Some of them are easy. Hishama of Harad. Elaka of Harad. Helez the Peltite. Iri, the son of Aikesh of Tekoa, familiar with Tekoa, remember the wise woman, Abiezer of Anathoth, Mabunai, the Hushathite, can't say something about uh, uh, Meb, Mabunai here, he's also the Sibakai, remember he's the Hushite who kills Soph, he was one of the giants. He's a giant killer as well. Some more. Zaman, the Ahohite. Maharai of Netophah. He lived the son of Baana of Netophah. Etai, the son of Ribai of Gibeah, of the people of Benjamin. Verse 30. We have Benai of Pirathon, Hidai of the brooks of Gashish. Now let's talk about Benaiah. This is not the this is uh, not the same one we saw above in verse twenty. It's another one, another Benaiah. The brooks here, a mountainous area north of which Joshua was buried at Timnath, Sarah Heres, eighteen miles northwest of Jerusalem in the hill country of. Ephraim. At least we can identify where this is at. It's where Joshua was buried. It's where this man's from. Some more names. Abi Alban, the Arbathite, Osmaveth of Bahurim, Eliaba, the Sha'abanite, and I look at this sons of in brackets, Josh. And Jonathan. Let's talk about this sons of for a moment because most of your translations I think have this in here because it's in the Masoretic text. Now I'm going to challenge that because I think it should just be Joshon. Here's what probably happened. Uh, the word, I'm going to draw this on the board for you just for a moment, just to show you the difficulty that scholars have in sorting out some of these texts. The word for um, son of Okay, it looks like this. This just I'm just going to give you the uh, consonants, basically. Oh, I can throw in some vowels here, okay. B'nai, uh, that's the word for son, so sons of Jason, okay. Now, 
the word before it. You see up there above, Sha'abonite. All right. The word ends in the same two letters. So what happens sometimes is copyists double copies. They call it dittography. Dittography. He copied it twice. So you got Elihaba, the Sha'abanite, Joshin. That's what it should say. And that's why I translated it. Okay. Then we have the name Jonathan. Not the famous friend of David. Of course not. Let's continue on. Let's get that out of the way. Verse 33. Shama the Heraite. Ahiam, the son of Sharar, the Herite. We see they're from the same clan. Elephalet, the son of Ahashai of Maaka. Eliam, the son of Ahithophel, the Gilanite. Now, this is interesting. This Eliam, he's the father of Bathsheba. He's also the son of Ahithophel, David's counselor, who defected to Absalom. So he's one of the more interesting characters here. So he's the father of Bathsheba. This is Eliam, also the son of Ahithophel, David's counselor, who went over to Absalom during the rebellion. Now, this would have been much later from the timing of this uh, recording of this passage. Well, we're moving pretty fast here. Not much I can do with these names. Heads row of Carmel. We're familiar with Carmel. That's the hill country of Judah, hometown of the infamous Nabal. Remember him? Abigail's husband, the fool. So Hezro of Carmel, Ba'arai, the Arbite. Verse 36. Egel, the son of Nathan, of Zobah, Bani, the Gedite. Now, let me just mention this. Now, now that we're almost done, I probably should have said it earlier. You'll see a lot of names that we're familiar with, but it just they're not the same people. Usually, I'll identify it's the same people. But uh, we have a lot of common names, all right? You have Nathan here again, okay? And names we'll see, uh, like Jonathan we saw already. Uh, we're going to come to another familiar one here in just a moment. So don't get confused or assume it's the same one. You have to do a little digging to make sure. Verse 37, Zelak the Ammonite, Naharai of Beeroth, the armor bearer of Joab, the son of Zariah. So there's Joab's armor bearer. He was known for his warrior skills as well. A couple more verses. Ira the Ithrite, Kareb the Ithrite, both from the same place. And then finally, perhaps one of the most famous, Uriah the Hittite. 37 in all. Well, that was some work, pronunciation work. And that completes our lesson, and we'll continue here next time. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we do thank you for your word today. It's been a challenging one. Um, we do thank you that you recognize the accomplishments of your people doing your will um, supporting David and then we see them recognized in this hall of fame as great warriors Lord Lord might we continue to support our righteous and godly rulers those who fear God we might we ask that we might have many rulers like that at every level of government we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.